One year on a family vacation, we were out in the mountains and we decided to go horseback riding together. And in typical fashion, whenever we do this with our four kids, I would put Cindy up at the front, the lead, and then our four kids were between us and I usually took up the rear. Now on this particular horse ride, horseback ride we went on, it was quite the experience because the horse that one of the, my kids were riding that was in front of me had a terrible case of IBS. I mean a terrible case of IBS. That has to be what was going on with this horse because the whole time as we are going down this trail, this horse in front of me just kept flagellating like crazy, droppings coming out. I mean, it was like the whole ride. It was loud. It was, it was stinky. It was, it was terrible. And my poor horse that I'm riding kept trying to back up and move to the side. It's like, <laughs> you know, and, and I was like, come on, keep going. I know it's bad, but just keep going. Now, why am I sharing that? What does that have to do with today's sermon? I don't know, but we're wrapping up a series we've been in for the last several weeks called Surviving the Parenting Jungle. And the reason I, I just share that story with you is because we're going down this trail and not only was that horse following the trail, but that horse was leaving a trail. <laughs> and it was a stinky trail. And today, this is the topic we're gonna be looking at is leaving a trail. Whether you realize it or not, as a parent or a grandparent, you are leaving a trail. You are leaving a trail for the next generation after you. The good and the bad and the stinky, all right? We are leaving a trail. So this is what we're gonna be looking at today. So I wanna dive into a first verse here, Proverbs 22, verse six. It tells us this, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now there's a lot really in that, that passage right there. And, and it says that if we, if we do our job as parents and we train up our children in the way that they should go, then when they get old, we've done our job, we're, we've moved on, then when they get old, they will not depart from it. And it just continues to repeat itself. We leave a trail and they leave a trail after them. Now, there's really a whole lot to this, this phrase here, because when it talks about training up a child, that phrase in the way, the Hebrew phrase there is more than just teaching them God's truths. It also has the implication, that phrase is used multiple times in, in Psalms, I mean in Proverbs, and it has to do with their, their God-given bent, part of their temperament, part of the gifting that God has on them. That as we, as we train them up in the way that God has in store for them, in their, in their spiritual gifts as they come to faith in Christ, their abilities and skill sets, their temperament, as well as impressing on them, teaching them the ways of God when they get old, then it says they will not depart from it. So I just want to give, kind of give a definition when I'm talking about leaving a trail. I just kind of have a working definition. What I mean by leaving a trail is that our purpose as parents is to leave a godly legacy for our children. That's what I mean by leaving a trail, that we're leaving a legacy. And our role and our responsibility, according to God's word, we're going to look at here this morning, as parents, our purpose is not just to leave a legacy, it's to leave a godly legacy. And passing on to our kids that which God calls us to according to his word. Now sometimes as Christians and as parents, you know, we, we kind of have this mindset, and I've watched this a lot through the years, that we have this mindset, if I can just get my kid around the right people, and so we'll, we'll bring them to church, you know, a couple times a month, and we'll, we'll make sure they get into Sunday school. And, and maybe, you know, if, you know, if there's a VBS going on, we'll send them to a VBS or we'll send them to a, a, a church camp. And, and our, there's this mindset that if I can just get them around the right people to influence them towards God, that I've done my job. But Scripture tells us that it's much more than that. It's not just getting them around the right people. Those are things that are all good, but our responsibility as parents is to be the primary influencer. Matter of fact, studies even show that the two greatest influence on a child's life are first, their parents, and second, their grandparents. All right, those are the two most significant influences on a child's life, their parents and then their grandparents. All right, so as I was sitting there thinking about this, as I was studying this week, I'm sitting there thinking about my own story. And I just thought, you know, my parents did all those things. They took us to church, they made sure we went to camp, did all those things. But I come to realize that never once in 17 years did any family member ever sit down with me and explain to me what it meant to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Not one conversation in the whole time 
I was growing up. We went to church every Sunday, pretty much every Sunday. My grandparents went to church. Matter of fact, I really admired, there was one family member I really admired, it was my grandfather on my mom's side. The guy was just really creative. I just, you know, I think, you know, I'm named after him, and he was just really creative. He's really witty. I try to be witty, try to be like him, you know. And, and, and he loved to fish. And he gave me and my brother our very first fishing pole. So as a little kid, God and my grandpa were right there together, you know. Because he taught me how to fish, you know, and I just learned a lot from him. But never once in all those years did any family member ever share with me how to live a godly life and how to have a personal relationship with Christ and how to walk it out. And so it's important because Scripture tells us this is important for us as parents. We're the primary influencers that God had intended. So what we're going to look at here is just how to leave a godly trail for your kids to follow, how to leave a godly trail for your kids to follow. And we're just going to look at a couple bullet points that I've got here. This is going to be really practical this morning, all right? The first thing you need to do as parents is simply this. Tell them where you're going. Tell them where you're going. Now, as I was studying, I told you this week, you know, that over the last several weeks, I was just kind of interested in just the whole jungle thing. And, you know, if you're going on an expedition and you're not going with a guide, one of the primary things they tell you to do when you go, before you go on your expedition, is to tell someone where you are going. Why? Because, guys, we don't like to follow directions, and we tend to get off the trail, and we get lost, and we don't want to admit it, right? And so there's times when we get lost, and then what happens when we're lost? Nobody's going to know where to find us, because they don't know where we're going. And so one of the things I do when I go fishing, sometimes, I, you know, depending on the weather, I don't know exactly where I'm going to go, if I'm going to hit a stream, or if I'm going to go to a lake. And so what I do when I go somewhere, when I get there and I decide, oh, the water's a little too high on the stream, I want to hit this lake. When I get there, every time I text my wife and say, hey, this is where I'm at. So in case something happens to me, God forbid anything would happen to me, but in case somebody would know where to find me. Now think about this when it comes to our spiritual life. We want our kids to be able to find us. We want our kids to be able to follow us and know where we're headed in this whole thing. All right? And so what's interesting is we need to, be able to, need to be able to ask a couple questions to ourselves. Where are you going in life? All right? It's a good question. You need to ask yourself, where, where am I going in life? Another one is, what is the purpose of life? Every child needs to know what the purpose of life is. And we need to be able to answer those ourselves. And so there's times, you know, when, when my wife, Cindy, and I, we get together with other couples, and we're trying to mentor them and coach them and, and stuff. That Just even recently, several weeks ago, we were meeting with a couple, and, and we asked them. We often ask people these questions, you know, and, and it's, we ask them, so what is your goal in your marriage? What is your goal for your children? And I'm telling you, it's like nine times out of ten when we ask these questions, the number one word that comes up is happiness. We just, want, we just want to live a happy life. We just want to have a happy marriage. We just want our kids to live a happy life. You know, and, and so we have this, this mindset that we're just going to just kind of create this to happy, keep it's everything, you know, just keep everything just right so we can just be happy. Now that's great, but it's missing this whole piece of where God is in the picture. And I think sometimes when we think of the Christian faith, it's like, it's like we, we have our life and then there's this little piece that we just kind of have to work God in. Rather than everything in our life is centered around God, which we're going to look at here this morning. And so the number one answer is typically to be happy. And I just want to enjoy a good life. It's not a bad answer, but it's only one small piece of the bigger picture of what God has in store for us. Now, I remember it was about 26 years ago that my oldest was born. And she's actually here this morning. She got to play keys with us. I'm glad she's in town from out of Missouri. But I remember when our firstborn came, and we were all excited. We are at the hospital. It was just, just a joyful, exciting moment. And then it's like, when well, you want to hold your baby, you know, and, and you, you got this thing in, in, in her hand. You're like, oh, my gosh, this thing's so fragile. What am I going to do? I don't want to break it. You know, I mean, you remember those moments? You know, you're just kind of, you know, and then it's like, what's this black stuff coming out? <laughs> what do I do? You know, and then the doctor lets you go home with this little thing. You know, and I just remember trying to put her in the car seat and the way the car seats are designed, you know, and in the car they're on an angle. And so the car seat's all great, but then they're like dumping the kid. And you're like, something's not right here. And I just remember that, that those first couple of days, it was just so scary figuring out this whole thing. And I just wanted to ask the doctor, I was like, doc, isn't there some kind of owner's manual that comes with this thing? I mean, is there, is there a 20-year warranty so that I can just be assured that my kid's going to do what I want him to do for 20 years? 
Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> well, what I want to convince you of this morning is that God does give us an owner's manual, and he does give us a warranty that comes with every kid. Now, every situation's different, and every child's different, and when they become an adult, they've got to make their decisions on how they're going to live their lives. But we've got this window of, of 18 years, 17, 18 years when they're with us, and then still, even when we send them out of the house, we still have the rest of our lives to influence them towards the person of Jesus Christ. And even as we're getting older, if we even become grandparents, we are still leaving a trail for our kids and our grandkids. And so it's important that we, we grasp this picture of what God has for us. So I want to open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And in this, I, I just really believe this is just a primary passage that God gives us in his word. This is right before God's people go into the promised land. And God gives these instructions to Moses. He says, I want you to give these to the people so they know how I want them to live their lives. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it'll be up on the screens as well. This is what it says. It says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your, so, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a moment. Most of the time, you know, when I talk to people, you know, that, that are either Christians or non-Christians, they're like, well, God just wants to ruin my life. He just wants me to live by these strict rules. My life's going to be boring. I want you to know that God wants you to enjoy life. He does. Jesus came to give us abundant life, a fulfilled life. But there's got to be boundaries. We talked about this in the series, and God gives us the guidelines of how he wants us to live. When we live according to his word, we can live and have a fulfilled life. He wants us to enjoy a long life. All right, verse 3. It says, Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Okay, you see there's this warranty, all right? Things will go well with you. If you do these things, things will go well with you. Now, it doesn't mean there's not going to be hiccups and, and bumps along the course of the way. There always is. This life is frail. We know that scripture has a lot more to say about that as well. But he gives us his warranty. Right? If we follow in his footsteps and if we follow what God lays out for us, that he promises things will go well with us. Verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. All right, so we see here in God's word that he, he gives us this, this warranty, this promise that if we do these things, we can enjoy life, this fulfilled life. He's taking us into a promised land. Now, today where that just would translate is that we're not actually going into a land, but Jesus Christ is our promised land, all right? That's where the land flowing with milk and honey is, is in a personal relationship with Christ. The fulfillment of all that God has for us is in Christ, all right? So as, we, as we're embracing these things and working them into our life, God has these promises that he lays out for this. So we just have to follow the manual that God has given us. And so I just want to kind of go through, go through this a little bit, breaking it down, and just give some bullet points. And I would say the next bullet point is like we're, we're showing them where we're going. We're going into this promised land, this faith in Christ. And the next bullet point I would say that goes along with this is to stay on the trail God has marked out for you. Stay on the trail that God has marked out for you. That means kind of two things. One is that we have to show our loyalty to God. We model loyalty to God as parents. And at the same time, along with this, that, that not only are we modeling it, but we're living out just what God has called us to. And our kids are watching us as we live this out. So let's go back and look at verse 2 again. It says this. It says, so that you, all right, so it's emphasizing us, so that things can go well with us, all right? your children and their children. So it's generations. It passes down from generation to generation. After them may, and there's this phrase here, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands 
that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. So we have to be an example of loyalty to God. And then in here is this phrase, to fear the Lord our God. And oftentimes this, this phrase here is, is misunderstood. Oftentimes when we see that word fear, we're like, no, God, ah! that he, he's out to punish us. You know, like he's this cosmic cop that's just ready to bust us for every little thing we've done. And, and we totally miss this picture of God's incredible grace that was perfectly displayed through Christ and his, his perfect sacrifice on the cross for us. And that God longs to lavish his love on us, to woo us to him. That is what we've talked about in this series, that he longs to be our father and us as obedient children to him, longing to stay connected with him. And so this fear of the Lord is a reverent awe of who God is. That's what it means, the fear of the Lord. That we understand who God is in his glory, in his majesty, as the king of kings and lord of lords, the one who is all-knowing and all-powerful, all who is full of love. And when we, when we look in the New Testament, we look at the word patient, that word patient, the King James probably nails it the best. It's long suffering. In other words, God puts up with so much for us. It's long suffering as he continues to extend his grace towards us. And so we have this, this, this awesome fear of who God is in his glory, in his majesty, in his power, in his goodness, in his loving kindness towards us. That's where it all starts. Matter of fact, if you open up the book of Proverbs, it's not in the notes, and you look at chapter one of Proverbs, and it's, the Proverbs is all about wisdom. Wisdom, of, of, it's a whole collection of wisdom, how to live life. It has a lot to say about children and everything else in life. Finances, you know, just everything. How to work, all this stuff. It's all in Proverbs. In the very beginning, as you start reading through the whole thing, you get to verse six, and it says, here's the deal. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want knowledge? It doesn't start by in some textbook. It starts by understanding God's book. The fear of the Lord and awe of who he is and what he has for us, that's where knowledge, that's where wisdom begins. And you see this phrase in the Hebrew mindset. It's all about understanding who God is and his place in our lives. So we have to model for our children and our grandchildren, all right, the children after them, just this loyalty to God. And so, so part of that is just we need to stay on the, the trail that God has marked out for us. And as we do that, our kids are going to be able to follow in our footsteps, watching how we walk with God and follow him. All right, another bullet point I just want to put in here is we need to live on mission so that your kids have a model to follow. We need to live on mission. We can't expect our kids to live missionally if we're not living missionally. And so this is really key. This is really important. It's how we, we live on mission. And what I mean by this is we need to demonstrate our faith to our kids. They see our faith alive. We're demonstrating it to them. We're demonstrating not because we're just trying to show them, because that's how we live our lives. All right? We demonstrate our faith so they can pick up and follow us. So we go back to verse 5. And it says, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So let me ask you this. As grandparents or parents... When kids, your kids look at your life, we're going to talk about this in our life groups. When they look at your life, what, it, what is it that they would say about your life? What are the key markings of your life? What would they say is the purpose of your life? And what's most important to you in life? All right, because, because sometimes it's easy to get, get our priorities all mixed up. And, and are, we, are we lovers of God? Are we full, fully following God, fully devoted followers of Christ and following after him? That in other words, he impacts every part of our life. Are we daily surrendered to Jesus Christ and living for him? Are we daily spending time in God's word? Now, I'm just excited. There's a number of you that have friended me on version, and I just see that a number of you are just daily spending time in God's word because in the middle of the night, it pops up. Some of you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I get this little notification, and I'm like, yes. Somebody's reading God's word. It's awesome. You know that we're committed to this. Let's go on, verse 6. When it comes to living on mission, it says this. It says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. All right? They'll be part of us. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What's this referring to? It's, it, what it's saying here is in, is, in other words, every aspect of your life is marked by following the person of Jesus Christ. 
what you do with your money, how you view money, how you spend it, how you use it, your job, how you work your job, how you interact with your spouse, with other people. Every aspect of our life is marked by following Jesus Christ. And that's what it's talking about here. Whatever we do, when we rise, whatever we get up in the morning and late at night throughout our whole day, every day, when we get up out of bed in the morning, we say, God, I give you this day. And every part of my life reflects you. When I'm on the job, I'm reflecting you. All right? So every part of our life needs to reflect the person of Christ. The lens of how we live in our marriage, in our job, how we use our money, all those things are in are, are reflecting of Christ. So when it comes to, you know, one of the things I just put in my notes here, when it comes to, you know, Cindy and I, most people think, well, well, you're a pastor, you're expected to do that. All right? I want you to know that the, my first career job was an audio engineer. Some of you know that. I worked at a TV station down in Bloomington at IU. Graduated from IU, an audio tech department, got a job as an audio engineer at the TV station, worked there for 10 years. All right? And I, and I, was, I did that for several years before I was given a title, pastor. Okay? And during, those, during that time when I was an audio engineer, I even did freelance audio at times. During that time, my wife and I, after we got married, you know, a couple years after college, you know, we graduated in 88, got married in 89. When we got married, our whole life was marked by being committed to God and his purposes. So after, after we, got, we got married that following year, we started a college ministry. There was a, a young guy who lived on my dorm floor. I led to Christ. He had a bunch of friends. In a short window of time, we had 30 students meeting in our house. The church was only about 100. And all these kids were, were plugged in at this church, and they were serving. And they're under our leadership. And so the leadership of the church came to us and said, hey, we want you to be part of our leadership team. We want to invite you to be part of our leadership team because you guys are leading about a third of our church, all these young people. And so we were already living missionally. My wife, Cindy, she was helping with children's ministry. Guess what I was doing? I was helping with the sound, <laughs> helping them set it up. They were using a lot of my equipment because they did. It was a, we met in a, a little school gymnasium. And so half the equipment was mine. Some of their equipment was bad. I was like, nah, I brought mine in. But we were serving. We regularly served. We were living missionally. And it was later on in the process of living that way that then the leadership came to me and asked me if I would come on part-time staff. But I still, for 10 years, I worked as an audio engineer. Okay, living on mission. So our kids watched us as we're living on mission. We took them with us on outreach projects. We incorporated them as they got older into things and serving in the church and the significance of that. We're leaving a trail for them. Another bullet point I just want to put on here, what I think this passage is talking about too, is share your God stories with them. All right, I want to go back and just look at verse 7. This is what it says. It says, impress them on your children. It doesn't say try to impress your children, all right? It says impress these things. And what that phrase impress means, the word impress means, is it means to continually repeat. Continually tell them, continue to share with them what God is doing in your life. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, we have lots of opportunities in the time we have our kids at home to have conversations with them about our faith in Christ and who God is and about God's word. Okay, we got all this time looking at things like what is God doing in your life? All right, you should be able to answer that question. If someone asks you, what is God doing in your life? And if you don't have an answer to that question, I would encourage you to spend time with God this week and say, God, what are you doing in my life? And start journaling, start praying, getting God's word. Because our kids need to know what God's doing in our life. We need to model that for them. We're following the person of Jesus Christ. What is he teaching you? And we share that with our kids. What is he speaking to you from his word? And we can sit down. And, and there's times when I would sit down with my kids and I'd and I, and I grab, a, you know, my, my Bible and I'd sit down with them. We'd highlight verses and we, we'd talk about things and we'd pray together on things. They knew what I was struggling with, what I wasn't good at, what I wanted to get better at. And we pray about those things. Okay, so it's, so it's important. So we're leaving a trail for them. And so, so another thing that I just remember that was really helpful was um, when it comes to just telling them God's stories was when I worked at, at the TV station as an audio engineer, you know, we would always pray for a list of people. You know, I'd have some people we'd write down. It's like, it's like oh, Daddy, who are we praying for this week? You know, and we pray for it. And I just remember there were several times I'd come home, and I was like, guys, I got some really exciting news. I got to lead someone to Christ today at work. One of the students came up to me 
and, and knew that I'd gone on staff at this church and, and they heard that I was a pastor and they came up to me and started asking me questions and, and just God just gave me the opportunity to lead that person to Christ right there. And I got to see them get baptized. And so we, we, we come together and we talk about these, we share them, our kids are like so excited and we pray for them and they'd ask, how are they doing? And so we're modeling for them that Jesus is the center of our lives. And you know, through the years as my kids were growing up, I got the opportunity to coach them coach soccer. A couple of my kids played soccer. They, they just love ath athletics. And so my two middle kids, my, my second oldest, she went to play um, soccer at Indiana Wesleyan. But when, when they were younger, I coached their, the rec league at St. Francis. All right. You know, and I was always just kind of pushing my kids, pushing my kids, you know, to, to be leaders out there on the field and to do, to do well out on the field. And they, they may have been great athletes, but more than anything else at the end of the day, I wanted them to follow Jesus Christ and pass that on to them. And I know that when God is, whether you realize it or not, you are leaving a trail for your kids to follow. Everything we do. So another bullet point I just want to put here is just pass on the survival tools that you are using and learning and following Jesus. In other words, we, we take the things that God's speaking to us. We get together with our kids, even when they're little. We can just break it down and make it really simple. And as they get older, we can make it more complex according to their age. And we got to pass on to them, this is what I'm doing. All right, this is what's helping me grow in my faith in Christ. And we pass on the tools. Because why? Because they someday are going to face the jungle of this world. And someday they may become a parent, and they're going to be in the middle of this, this parenting jungle trying to figure it out, but they're going to have a model to follow on how to do it because we modeled it for them. And we passed on to them the survival skills that we are using, the tools that God has given us on how we're surviving, how God is helping us, how God is leading us. And, you know, and, and we, through the years, you know, we've, we've, made, we've been through several challenging transitions when our kids were little, we felt like God was calling us to church planting. And so my, my wife, Cindy, she was eight months pregnant, and our three little ones running around the house, and, and we moved from Bloomington up here to Greenwood to be around a guy who had experienced church planting. I was told we, we moved up here. And so our kids are just watching us through this transition, but it was challenging for them as well because they were leaving their friends behind. But they're watching us as we're walking through these transitions. And then I've been on staff at two other churches prior to us starting this church, and our kids were able to watch us go through the good, bad, and even the stinky moments when, you know, when I'm just, I'm, I'm frustrated, you know, things aren't going well. And then I got a model for them, look, the way dad handled this was not good, was not right. This is not what God calls us to. And so it's so important that we pass these things on to them. And the last thing I just want to share here before I have my wife Cindy come up is we need to empower them to lead down the trail. If we want our kids to learn how to lead, then we've got to empower them to lead. And I know sometimes, you know, it, it dads, you know, we want our, our, our sons, you know, and our kids to learn how to take care of their cars, you know, so if they're stranded down the road, they need to learn how to change a tire, right? They need how to check the oil before they, before they drive, you know, on a, on a trip somewhere. They got to learn all these things, but more than anything else, we've got to empower them to lead, and look for opportunities when they're real little. Here's a real simple one you can, you can pass on to them. is just when it comes to their, their, their money, all right? When they're real little, they go and they do go help grandma and grandpa at their house. Grandma hands them 20 bucks. Oh, thank you. you know, it's, my grandma did it to me. Here's 20 bucks. Thanks for helping, you know, shovel the snow or whatever, all right? And then you say, okay, what are you going to do with that $20? I don't know. We'll go buy some candy. Well, you know what the Bible says about money? Let's look in some verses. We look in God's word about verses setting aside a portion of that money every week, what we earn to give it to God and trust him with our lives. And then as they're getting older and they start to incorporate this, and they start tithing and you're watching it, you know, and you're praying with them, then they begin to see how God is taking care of you as you've done that and how God starts to provide for them as they're doing it. And it's just simple little things. We model, we pass them, and then we give them opportunities to lead. So you guys have been a gracious group, you know, family, to where my son's in seminary right now, and you've been gracious. We've let him, I think we've preached five times here in the last couple of years. And we just always try to give our kids opportunities to lead. And you know what? It's okay if they fail. It's okay. Because God is still on the throne, and God is going to take care of them. 
And so it's important that as parents, if we're going to do this, we've got to empower our kids to lead and look for opportunities. Let them step out on faith. It's like, hey, why don't you start a Bible study with your friends? Well, I don't know if I, oh, you can do it. Let's, let's get together. I'll help you prep for it. And you challenge them to step out in faith and watch God work in their life. Because someday, what we want to do as parents, right, we want them to leave our house. We want them to be responsible adults and be able to hold a job down, be able to put money in the bank, all right, so they've got savings and all those things, right? But more than anything else, we want them to know how to follow Jesus. So we're leaving a trail for them and learning how to live a godly life. And when it comes to that whole big R word, relationship, it's like, oh, my gosh, we want to make sure they marry the right person. So we have conversations on what that looks like, what a godly person looks like. And just don't marry somebody just because you like them. Marry somebody that's following Jesus because if you don't, then it's going to be a challenge along the course of the way. And so we pass all these things, empower them to lead, and pass these on. I'm going to ask Cindy to come over and share a section with this Get your notes out here for you. Oops. You got 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, we're, we are. We're going to just, we're going to wrap up. <laughs> um, we're going to just wrap up the series um, looking at a passage from First Peter. So um, First Peter chapter 2, I think it's up there. Yeah. Um, 9 to 11, it says, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who calls you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So, You know, it is so important in leaving a trail for our kids that we understand who we are. We have such an amazing body of believers right here. I mean, you guys um, long to love well, and you long to worship with a pure heart, and I just feel privileged, you know, to be a part of this body of Christ. And we need to remember, you know, who we are and have our identity in this. You know, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We are the people of God. And then what we have to remember is, you know, our kids are not the future church. They are the church. They are a royal priesthood. They are the people of God. And we raise our kids with this. And that is what's going to cause them to long to follow us. It is a privilege to be a part of the people of God. So we just have to, you know, just bringing it full circle, you know, as we talk to our kids throughout the week and throughout the day and we get in the word with them, um, one of the conversations is, you know, who we are. And um, it's so easy, you know, you know, when our kids go to school, they spend six, seven, eight hours there and they're hearing those voices. Do you know, do we know what those voices are saying to our kids? That's a really important It's super important because when we know that our identity is in that we are a people of God and we pass that on to our kids, we need to make sure that they, that they're hearing that, you know, and that there aren't people out there lying, you know, there, I mean, that's the enemy wants to pull them away. Um, You know, the tendency, and we all have done this as we've grown up and we still deal with it a lot of times, but you know, you know, is our identity in, oh, I belong to this group of friends. Or is our kid's identity, and I'm a basketball player, and I belong to the team, and that's who I am. Or am I, I'm a musician, and that's what I belong to. You know, and it's easy for our kids to get their identity met in those things. And this is one of the things that we want to teach them. You know, our identity is in Jesus. Our identity is in Christ. Our identity is the fact that we belong to the people of God. And that is a privilege. We are a royal priesthood. You know, we serve the living God, and we know him, and that needs to be their identity. So here's what happens, um, raising kids, you know, and this is our practical um, part of this. I don't feel like going today, Mom. Okay, it, this could be your kindergartner, this could be your fifth grader, this could be your teenager. It happens at all ages. We ha- it happens to us. <laughs> um, 
And it could be, you know, they don't feel like going to church or they don't feel like even getting to go with their friend that's from church or they don't feel like going to the church picnic or whatever it is, you know, I don't feel like going today. So what do we do with that? We sit down and we, we're honest. We say, you know what, buddy? Sometimes I don't feel like going either. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm tired, you know, and I don't, I don't want to. But you know what the Word of God says? The Word of God says that we are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are the people belonging to God. And we belong to the people of God. And over in Hebrews, it even says, let us consider, it says, how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds, and let us not give up meeting together. And so it's important, even when we don't feel like it, we, we know we got to be a part of it. That's who we are. And we, we breathe this into our kids. That's who we are. We are the people of God, and we serve a living God, and it is a privilege to serve the living and God and to be a part of a messed up people. You know, none of us in here are perfect, but we love the Lord, and we love him together, and we strive together, and we spur one another on, and that's how we raise our kids. We raise them with that longing and desire, you know, to be a part of the people of God um, because it's a privilege. <laughs>